Now I introduced you to this a couple of weeks ago. It's my attempt at a cyber deck. And the idea is that you have a box, like a lunch box in this case, that opens out into a computer. And the concept here was that the computer could run off lots of different power sources by plugging into here anything from five to 24 volts, which would be displayed on this display here, along with the current that was being pulled. Or it could also run off of an internal battery. Now, this has a number of features. I've got a load of different memory card readers here, including a little micro SD card reader. I have three USB 3 ports, a Raspberry Pi GPIO port, some buttons that do things like select the power supply and allow you to reboot and shut down, a touch screen, and then round the back, I have this port here, which isn't screwed on, that has Ethernet, two HDMI ports, and a micro SD port, and that was for charging the battery up. And there's the, um, the connector for it, I think. And then on the sides, we've got speakers. And when all plugged together, this, this is the problem I had with it. So it became a bit of a lunchbox and it was gonna have a handle here. So you can see the profile makes a nice square. Now, I quite like this whole design, but my execution of the design was pretty poor. The concept was take an aluminium piece of sheet and then create the, uh, the box around it using glue. And that never really works. And then these brackets, which are very tight, which then clip the whole thing together. And it, the problem was, is it was never really strong enough. Uh, I did this quite a few years ago. My skills in 3D modeling have got a bit better and I'm using a different program. So I could redo all this, but it took me quite a lot of time to get to this stage and quite a lot of prints that failed and what needed tweaks and so on. It took me a long time to get to this point. So I've decided a new approach might be to start from an existing box and build it out from there. So the box I'm thinking of using is this box here. This is my old Proxon case. Now I've got two of these cases because I've had two Proxons. One died on me after a lot of abuse. Um, so I've got two cases. So I think this might be quite a good case. It's similar size to this. It's not quite as deep, but it's a little bit wider. So I'll take this keyboard, for instance. You can see the keyboard fits in there nicely. Um, it's going to need a little fettling and probably some 3D prints or some wood around the outside so that it fits. And I'm thinking there's probably enough space or there's a little bit of space underneath that I can create some compartments underneath to store some gear that I'm gonna need for the concept for this build. And then in, the, in this part here, which is the main compartment, this is actually the lid in the main compartment We've then got space in here. I'll have to cut this out here, but keep most of the fabric of this box together. And then I'll have space for the touch screen, all of the different gadgets that I've got displayed here, the speakers, the batteries, the Raspberry Pi and so on. I'm hoping to fit all of that inside here. So this is my, and then obviously this can then just fold up and it'll work nicely. Now, the original concept with this one was a society reboot tool. The idea was you'd had the zombie apocalypse and you were trying to rebuild society and the things you need if you're gonna rebuild society are things like how stuff's built, how stuff's made and so on. 
and you also want to keep a history of what's gone before and therefore it had things like Wikipedia on it, it had Stack Exchange. Whilst that was just a tongue-in-cheek idea and concept, it isn't really that practical because um, it's just going to be sitting here doing nothing until we have the zombie apocalypse, which clearly is never going to happen. Um, it's just uh, something that happens in Shaun of the Dead. But I thought what I really want to do is make something like a cyber deck that actually has some practical use around the house. So what I want to end up with is something that can be used as a development tool for things like uh, microcontroller circuits and um, software engineering those microcontroller circuits so that I can build the circuit all in this one tool, test them, prove that they work, prove that they move servos, light LEDs, whatever, and it be an all-in-one kit for messing around with my microcontroller circuits. So I'm going to start by creating some additional space in this corner by removing this using my Proxon multi-tool. Now whilst this might not sound like a woodwork project, stick with me because there's quite a lot of woodwork in this build and I'm going to be skipping over the electronics and the programming and the setting up of the computer itself. You know, I will go through bits of it but not in any great detail. Now the original Cyberdeck used to boot up okay but currently it's not booting up and I really put that down to the fact that some of the components inside are moving around a little bit and the case isn't particularly strong and I think something's touching something and preventing it from booting up. So I'm going to take the whole thing apart and just see where all the components can fit so that we can build it into the new case. And I'll worry about getting it working again once I understand where all the bits are going to go. So some of the other considerations I need to worry about are it's going to be used in this configuration. All the weight though is going to be in this piece here. So I'm going to need some way of opening it so that it stays in this position. So that probably means some little fold out legs on the back just to support the weight while it's in this sort of configuration. I'm also expecting to be able to either operate this with the keyboard in, although these might get in the way, or be able to lift the keyboard out and use it completely separately. So I'm thinking I will cut a hole out of this, then drop in some sides to the hole so that I've got a deeper area to put parts and wires and the project that I'm working on. I'm going to cut a, a rectangle out of here using the Stanley knife. And so that I cut it the right size, I've double-sided taped this piece of paper to it. And this piece of paper has a faint line where the hole needs to be and the outside edge of the paper is the lip of the 3D printed part that I'm going to insert in here. So the piece I was going to 3D print in here relied on this area being flat but what I hadn't really considered was this embossing on the outside of the box. So I decided I would try just using some double sided tape and I'll need to use two layers on the lower sections and I had a test to see how well that would work with a small piece of veneer and you can see that it's stuck fast so I'm going to take this off and that's how I'm going to proceed to stick down the veneer I'm just going to use double-sided tape I'm just using double sided tape to glue the veneer in place and then I'll also secure it by clipping the gridfinity unit that I've created on top. Now I've always thought of myself as a maker first and a woodworker second and it's really nice to be able to combine working with plastic and electronics and wood all together. I think it just enhances the projects you make rather than detracting from them. If you think the same then let me know in the comments. Now I was trying to work out the best way to do this. I put this Gridfinity tray in the bottom so that I could hold parts in the using the Gridfinity system. Probably not these parts, these are a little bit too tall. But I want this area to be like a storage area. 
and then the keyboard will sit on top. Now the problem with that is obviously when this closes, there's nothing to stop this keyboard from falling into here and there's nothing then to stop all these parts falling out and um, creating a bit of a mess. So I need to sort of conjure up some sort of idea that will hold the keyboard in place and also hold all of these Gridfinity boxes in place so that I can close this with confidence knowing that I'm not going to lose anything. So let me explain how I'm going to build this cover that's going to hold the keyboard. So I need to cut it out so that it's the same shape as the cavity in the lid that the keyboard's going to go in. And I find that having the wood grain going along always looks nicer than if it was going up. So I've oriented the board in this direction so that I've got the grain going in the same direction. This is a piece of um, three millimeter ply. It's an eighth of an inch. It's second hand, it's about 50 years old. It's got all this tape on the outside. So I want to avoid cutting where this tape is because I know that it leaves a um, darker material underneath where this is faded. So I'm going to make my first cut along here and that will then become my reference. My second cut will then be along here so that this is then cut to the right width. I'll then make a cut along here and then a fourth cut along here and then I'll have a board that's the right size but I'll still need to sort out the corners. I need to add a bit of a slope to the edge of this board. So I'm just going to do that using the bench sander. The board itself is probably slightly oversized. So I'm probably still gonna need to sand the edges to fettle it to shape and to size, but that'll be a lot easier when the edges are a little bit thinner because of the slight chamfer on all the edges that I'm about to give it. Well, I could edit it out and you'd never know, but you can see that the bench sander was a little bit aggressive. I thought that using the bench sander would have been a good idea just because it's got a bed on it that I could angle and therefore I could get a perfect angle all the way along. But I think I'm going to have to do it by hand. I use a combination of sawdust and super glue or CA glue just to fix that area that got damaged by the bench sander. And cut this hole out to accommodate the shape of the keyboard. But before I do that, I'm just going to scribe around the edges and that'll give me a neater finish and it'll give me a line to follow. Now, if I had a fret saw, I'd probably use that. I do have a coping saw that I could use by drilling a hole and fitting the coping saw. But I'm going to use this pull saw because it's a very thin piece of wood and I don't think it'd be that difficult to do using the pull saw to get through the wood and then use the pull saw in a normal sort of fashion. Now this is such a good fit that I don't think I'm going to bother putting anything else in to hold it in place. It just fits really nice. It's a friction fit. You can see it's nicely sealed all the way around. It doesn't come out unless you pull it, which I will need to do in order to get to the stuff below. But when it's such a good fit, I really don't see the point in adding anything else. I guess with time, if it becomes loose, then I might have to add some little shelves or brackets underneath to hold it in place. And then the keyboard sits in there like that. Now the keyboard's going to be fixed using magnets. I'll show you how I'm going to do that later. But first I'm going to sand this down and prepare it ready for the finish. Now doesn't that look gorgeous? So I've refitted the wooden surround for the keyboard holder and you can see that the keyboard doesn't come off. And the reason it doesn't come off is it turns out the keyboard's actually made of steel or sheet steel and I've stuck a couple of magnets on the back and they hold the keyboard nicely in place. 
that also holds this just being a friction fit holds all the parts that are underneath in place as well so I think other than populating the underneath with all of the gridfinity system this half is now complete so I now need to work on this half just want to emphasize the reason for checking things now you would expect this corner and this corner to be the same radius and also to be the same as this corner and this corner but they're not this corner here has got a much wider radius than this corner for some reason these corners here are both the same radius so i've actually got three different radii to consider this one for these two bottom corners this little one for the top right hand corner and this medium size one for the top left hand corner that's why it's a good idea to check these things So I've been trying to think about how to get this screen in this corner here like this but also make it so that I can take it out for maintenance and so on and the solution I've come up with which may not work is I've added a board to the back of the screen and the Raspberry Pi and I'm going to add some magnets here then some magnets on here and then it'll connect magnetically to the corner. Don't really know if it's going to work, but I'm going to give it a go. I'll leave that a while for the glue to cure before I attempt taking the screen off. It's possible that the magnets are so strong that it'll rip the double-sided tape off rather than separating at the magnets, but we'll see. So let me explain where I am. I have my keyboard which is magnetically connected and wirelessly connected to the computer. Underneath the keyboard cover is the Gridfinity system that I can put components and leads and whatnot in. The Raspberry Pi computer is sitting on the back of the LCD screen and the whole thing is magnetically connected to the bottom of the case and it stays there very nicely. I've got this UPS uninterruptible power supply system which will hopefully run this screen and the computer for about seven hours. I need to test that but that's what the measurements suggest at the moment but you know if it does four hours that'd be brilliant. Um, so my calculations are seven hours are pretty good. I've got a switch for turning the thing on and off. Although obviously being a computer you need to shut down before you turn off. I've got a 12 volt in power supply so that I can power it directly. And when it's being powered it's also charging the battery just like a laptop would, would work. So this is currently work, working off of the batteries, but it can equally work off of a 12 volt supply. And then this thing here is a little oscilloscope. It's called the Bitscope Micro. It's been out about 10 years. I've always wanted one. It's got a 20 megahertz bandwidth, I believe. I'm just waiting for an extra bit called the hammerhead, which gives me access to um, BNC connectors so that I can put proper oscilloscope probes on for when I'm messing around with um, communication protocols and things um, on microcontrollers. So it's also got an eight channel logic analyzer which can work up to 12 volts. The analog works up to 50 volts and you can reconfigure two of the logic analyzer pins to work as an analog oscilloscope and you can also configure one of the pins to work as a clock and another one of the pins to work as a signal generator 
So it's got quite a lot of functionality in what is a tiny board. It was quite an expensive thing. I got this one brand new off of eBay. It's about half the price of what they should be. So I got it for a reasonable price. Although I have had to buy the hammerhead adapter. I'm going to have to buy a little cable because this is going to sit inside here and there'll be a little cable coming out with the BNC connectors on and all the logic analyzer outputs or inputs on as well. So I need a little cable for that, which I need to get. Um, and that will allow me to bring it out to this, which is going to be the faceplate. This is just a piece of ply. It's going to sit on there like that. I should cut out the screen. Cut out some holes for the for the power and the power button and then the BNC connectors. So we're getting close to having it finished. Oh, something else I've forgotten to mention is I have this which was in the original cyber deck. This is a um, card reader. It takes four different cards, although I'm not sure what they all are. And then we've got three USB 3 ports. So that'll be plugged in as well. So I need to somehow work out how to mount that. I'm just deciding, do I mount it like this as one big module or do I have it as I had it before, side by side? Can't believe it, I've just cracked the screen. I've got this far and I've cracked the screen. I'm so disappointed with myself. I was just fitting this, trying to work out exactly where it would go. I hadn't taken the screen out because I wanted to measure the distance from here to the edge of the screen. So I thought I'd do that after I'd fitted this one more time and I cracked it. That is so disappointing. I've had a look, you can't buy new glass for these things. So it means a whole new screen. The new screens are about 80 pounds. I found a different screen which will work in a very similar way, but it's a higher resolution, some slight, physically the same size, but a larger viewing area. So I think I'll probably end up getting that, but it's 75 pounds plus postage, which I really didn't want to spend. And this has gone from being a project of just updating what I already had and you know buying a few little bits to becoming quite an expensive project. It's probably going to cost me a couple of hundred pounds in total now. Anyway, let's get on with the video. So I've got this far, I might as well carry on. I'm going to cut out this panel here, and this is where the screen will go through. The new screen will go behind this piece of wood, whereas the old screen will probably look better in front of the piece of wood. I'm not completely sure yet, but I'm cutting the hole for in the expectation of buying a new screen. I just can't bring myself to buy a new screen just yet when the rest of the project isn't finished. So I'm going to finish the rest of the project before I even contemplate buying it, I think. So the approach for cutting this out last time on the keyboard piece worked really well. So I'm going to follow the same approach with this, which is I'm going to mark it out with a knife first. Then I'm going to use my pull saw to cut the rectangle out. So I've marked everything up, ready to cut out. I'm going to have the power socket in the corner here, so it'll be out of the way. The power switch next to it. My USB hub and card reader along here. I'm then going to have the two BNC connectors for the oscilloscope probes here. And then in the middle, there will be the pins that allow me to use it as a logic analyzer or tap onto it for the signal generator or the clock. And then I've got this variable power supply, which I'm hoping will run from the battery or, or directly from the power socket. And that will give me zero to 36 volts. And I'll be able to adjust the current and it's got some other capabilities on it to do things like measure the current and the voltage that's being delivered and drawn from it at any one time. The one thing I haven't quite decided yet is how to 
attach things to the power that's coming out of this. So one option that I thought of using and will probably build, I don't know, is to use these things. These are IDC connectors. These are great because they work with these little jumper wires. It's just a standard way of connecting stuff when you're experimenting with prototyping boards and things. So that would work quite well, except I realised that these jumper wires don't come very long. You can get longer ones than these, but they don't come particularly long, and therefore they might be a bit of a hindrance using these alone. So then I thought I could possibly use a more traditional approach for a variable power supply, which is to use banana leads. These are pretty good. They're the same leads that you use on multimeters and things, and they're generally about a meter long. So they would work well in that respect. The problem with these is they're pretty tall. You can see how big the pin is. So they would actually stick out quite a lot. And when the box is closed, I'm worried that this fascia isn't going to be far enough back for there to be space in the lid to accommodate those banana lead connections from sticking out and touching the keyboard. So I'm going to decide exactly what I'm going to do here later once I've got this panel fitted. That will mean I can then measure exactly how much space I've got and if I do indeed have enough space for the banana leads. I might even end up doing both, having the IDC connector and the banana leads. I think that would be quite nice and it would sort of mirror what will be going on here. So that would look quite nice. So I'm going to leave that bit for now, but I am going to cut out the hole for the power supply unit, the holes for the BNC connectors and logic probe, the card reader, the power switch and the power socket. So the fascia is all now cut out. If I've done all my measurements correctly, everything should fit. So I'm now going to do a little bit of sanding, finish it with some Danish oil and then start fitting the components. This is the original fascia on the original Cyberdeck. Now I no longer have the 3D files for these, they seem to have been lost and I really don't have the appetite to redraw out the fascia for the USB and card reader. So I'm going to see if I can salvage this and stick the front of this fascia back onto the new Cyberdeck. So I think this fascia has come out okay. It will certainly work and it's better than having to redesign it all over again. Most parts will simply clip in but for a few of them I'm going to need to resort to some hot glue. So let's have a closer look inside my little cyber deck. So the first thing you'll notice is all the electronics components are connected to the back of the fascia. And I've done that so that it's nice and easy and convenient if I want to modify it or tweak it or do any bits to it. It's all in one package. I've not got bits connected to the case and bits connected to the fascia. So let me just go through this if you're not familiar with electronics and single board computers and things. This is the screen. On the screen, the Raspberry Pi is bolted. It's connected via some pogo pins, which are little spring-loaded brass pins, which connect it to power and also to an I2C port. The I2C port is used for the touch control. The Raspberry Pi is also connected via the I2C port of the UPS, that's so you can read off the battery level, the charging level, the voltage, the current being drawn, and so on. The UPS itself has a port going to a socket which allows you to charge the batteries whilst still powering the Raspberry Pi. 
it has a power switch, a 5 volts out which powers the Raspberry Pi, and then a 12 volts out which powers the variable voltage programmable current limited power supply. This thing here is the Bitscope Micro. This is a 20 megahertz bandwidth two channel oscilloscope. It can also be an eight channel logic analyzer and it can also output a clock and a signal. So it's a signal generator as well. This is wired off to something called a hammerhead port, which just is a more convenient way of connecting to an oscilloscope. So we've got BNC connectors, which are the standard way for analog oscilloscopes. And then we've got an IDC pinout, which can be used to access the logic channels and so on. And finally, we have this USB 3, three port hub and four port card reader. And that's pretty much everything. This then connects quite nicely into the case. So what do you think? This is a slightly different video to normal, and so I'd love your comments. I'd love to know if you enjoyed this video or if it was just a little bit too much electronics for you. I really liked how this turned out. I think the wooden accents have really enhanced this project. I love that this oscilloscope is sitting in an old Proxon rotary tool case because it won't feel out of place in the workshop. And not only can I use it as an oscilloscope and a power supply unit and a function generator and a clock generator and so on, I can also use it to display woodworking plans and videos for when, I've, when I'm stuck in the workshop and not sure how to do something and I'm researching something then I can bring up YouTube and use that. So I think this is going to make a great addition to my workshop. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, then please leave me a thumbs up. If you know anyone that might like this video, then please share it with them. If you haven't already, then please subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.